with you guys today. It's such an honor for Darren and I to be able to be here, to be able to speak um, with you again together. It's so wonderful to be a part of this Mercy Road community. We are just immensely thankful for that. Um, We are excited about what God has laid on our hearts to share today. It was so good to be with you on Mother's Day and just to hear the cool things that God did um, through that time with us all together then. And so we're excited um, for the Lord to just use us as his vessels this morning, move us out of the way, um, and for you guys to really hear what God has to say to you this morning. So I want to thank Josh this morning. Happy Father's Day to him. He is in California. He could be asleep. I don't know. It's probably really early over there. But good morning to him and Lisa, if they by chance are online watching him. And happy Father's Day to Josh. It's so good to be here. Um, Let's take a moment to pray and get our hearts just focused on Jesus this morning as um, Darren starts out bringing the word for us. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you so much for this day. Lord, I just want to specifically thank you for fathers this morning. I want to thank you for my dad, for my father-in-law, and for Darren, and the amazing men that um, are creating an amazing legacy for my three boys to someday be fathers, and who can be fathers who are Christians who love you and serve you. And I pray that same prayer for all the young men that are being raised up, that they will grow up to love you and know you and serve you. May today's message that you've given us be one that challenges dads and moms anyone who's here today, just to be exactly who they need to be, to be able to be present, passionate, and just really seeking after you with all their heart. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thanks, Jules. So, uh, Father's Day, right? It's kind of crazy. I was thinking about it uh, in first service, and it's, you know how you, like, you get older, but you still see the world through your same eyes, and you kind of forget you're old, right, or getting older, right? And so I kind of forget that, like, like, when I think of Father's Day, I think, well, that's what, you know, that's for dads, you know, like old guys that are fathers. And I realize, wait a second, I am a father, right? And I got three kids, and I'm getting old, right? And it was just kind of this weird thing where, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm a father. That's a, I've had a lot of Father's Day, but it's just interesting. And Father's Day is something that uh, I think is, uh, you know, it's different. I think, like, Mother's Day has, like, you know, this warm, fuzzy, it's like kind of thing. And I always kind of feel like, you know, they just, somebody decided we should probably have a Father's Day too, right? But, you know, it's not as warm and fuzzy as Mother's Day is. But if you're here this morning and you are a father, I hope some of the things we share today will be encouraging or uh, in, inspiring to you. If you're not a father uh, and you're here, uh, well, you, you're here means you had a father, which uh, you can celebrate him. Uh, and, um, or if, if, if you long to be that uh, in your life, uh, I, I hope that today is, is inspiring to you. Um, and uh, I had an interesting conversation with my five-year-old this week. Um, as we were preparing this sermon, we left his last uh, baseball game, and he plays uh, like coach pitch. He gets like six pitches or seven pitches, and if they don't hit the ball, it goes on the tee, and uh, it, 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 it's fun, right? And he loves it. Like Knox, our little guy, he lives for it. I mean, he gets eye black and sunglasses. I mean, he, like, he wakes up in the morning on a game day, and all day long he's just asking, when is his game? Like he can't wait, right? So his last game was this, was this week, and... Uh, we go to his game, and, and, and he played great. It was exciting. And then we went <clears throat> to, to out to eat for because it was celebrate his last game, right? And as a coach, I don't know, does anybody coach youth sports and their coaches, right? Awesome. The greatest thing about coaching is that usually at the end of the, at the season, they give you a gift card to Dick's Sporting Goods. And so now I've coached long enough that I just basically coach to get the gift card. It's basically what I'm... So, so I get my gift card. I'm like, we're going to go eat. We're going to go to Dick's. And I got, you know, those, those Yeti uh, 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 thermoses, right? I had it picked out. I was like, I'm getting the gift card. I'm getting a thermos. I've been drinking out of it all week. So thank you, T-Ball, for my Yeti uh, uh, cup. But anyway, so we're walking out of Dick's Sporting Goods, and I'm, I'm holding Knox's hand, and, and we're just walking. And, and, and he looks up at me and asks me an amazingly profound question. He looks up, and he says, Daddy? I said, yeah, buddy. He said, are you proud of me? I looked at him, I said, but I was like, I'm so proud of you, man. It's like, you, you did great today, and, you know, I love you, buddy. I'm so proud of you. And it just started to kind of stick in my mind all week. And as we look at this idea of, 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 um, of Father's Day and celebrate this, the reality that, that, that blows my mind is the relationship that Jesus had with his father. They had the greatest father-son connection anyone could ever want. And what's kind of weird to me is that when, and I'll be honest, like when I think about God the Father, a lot of times I think of him like you see him in the movies, right? 
Like he's the really scary, old, crusty, mean God, right? And he's just there because he really would like to smite someone or turn someone into a pillar of small salt, right? And, and you just kind of have this feeling like you read the Bible, you're like, man, God the Father in the Old Testament, he's mean. And then at some point, you know, between Old Testament and New Testament, God got really nice and came as Jesus, right? And then Jesus is nice and the Father's mean. Like that's how we feel sometimes, at least I do. But what blows my mind is how... The, the, the consuming passion of Jesus's life was to do everything he could do so that we could know his dad the way that he did. Like Jesus didn't think his dad was mean and a crusty old man that wanted to kill people. Jesus knew that his father was love, that his father was the greatest father ever. He was the father of, of humanity, of everything. And everything Jesus did was so that we could know his father. So I was looking at the word this week and just looking at that relationship. And in this conversation with Knox, I brought me to this point that, that, that I really, really, I want you to hear this morning because I feel like it's so foundational for us to really be able to move into the depth of relationship that God desires that we would have with him as his kids. And the... Um, the interaction in Jesus' life is in Matthew chapter 3, and it's his baptism. And we, we've talked about this before. I think Josh actually preached about it a couple months ago, and I've talked about it before. But, but Jesus is, is, is coming to be baptized. It's early in his ministry, right? And, and the, the, the interesting thing is, is that at this point in his life, he's not done any of the Jesus stuff yet, right? He's basically just been Jesus, the man, the carpenter, the son of Joseph, the Mary. Like, he's not done jesus stuff yet. But he comes to his baptism, and it goes like this in Matthew chapter 3. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to, f- to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented, and as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Amazing moment, right? But I got to thinking this week is, what exactly had Jesus done up until this point to really make his dad proud of him, right? Like, I get it. I mean, he feeds 5,000 people, walks on some water, heals a dead guy, like all the stuff he does. I could see his dad being like, you killed it on that one, son, right? That was awesome, right? Walking on water thing, bit proud of you, proud of you for that. Hey, feeding the 5,000, impressive job, son, right? But Jesus has done nothing to this point. He was a dude. He was, a, he was, a, he did, we don't know. Like we see Jesus at 12 in the temple, right? And then we really don't see Jesus. We don't know what really happened in his life from 12 to 30. It's not written about in the Bible. But what we, knew, what we do know is that at least it wasn't that noteworthy enough or really awesome jesus stuff to make it in the Bible, But for some reason, Jesus' father felt like it was important that before he did any of the cool Jesus stuff, that he knew that his dad loved him and approved of him and was proud of him because of who he was, not because of what he would do. See, friends, God's affection and approval for us does not flow out of our performance for him. It flows out of our position and our identity as his children. And I could say that to you every week until we all die and it wouldn't be enough. You need to wake up every single day and tell yourself and every night before you go to bed, that God's affection and approval of me do not proceed from my performance for him today. I am loved because of who he is and who I am in him, because my dad is proud of me. You see, this thought came to me the next morning. We're sitting down. I was drinking my coffee in the morning, and Knox came and sat down in the sunroom with me, and I realized the context of his question. The reason he asked me if I was proud of him is because some cool things happened that day. We're getting ready to start the game, and one of the families from Cole's 11U baseball team came out just to watch little Knoxer play his last game. And then five of the boys in our neighborhood, these high school boys, took time out of their day and drove over and surprised Knox to come watch him play his last baseball game. 
So I'm watching Knox. He's there at third base with his eye black on and his sunglasses, like just ready to go. And he looks over and he sees this family coming and he goes, and I was going, I said, Knox, look, look over there. Who's coming through the trees? And he was like, all the neighborhood kids? He was like, dad. He's like, first the piles, now all the neighborhood kids? He was like, this is amazing, right? And he got up for his first at bat, and you should have seen him. He got up. He was so just ready to go, and he had all these people here to watch him, right? And the kid's a freak of nature. He hit the ball so hard. It's so funny, right? So he just gets in and just destroys the ball, except it goes straight up in the air. And in T-ball, no one catches pot flies, okay? It's just herding cats. It's not, it's craziness, right? And this little twerp at first base caught. <laughs> caught Knox's pot fly. And he just folded at the kid caught and he was just like and he just like moseyed his way back to the bench you know he got up his next time and he destroyed the ball to center and the rest of his at bats he just killed it but that morning i realized i thought you know why he asked me if he was if i was proud of him because maybe for the first time in his life he felt the pressure of performance i'm here the neighbors are here Mom and dad's friends are here. They're watching. They're watching me. Dad's watching me. I know how he is with the other boys, and he coaches them. And, man, I've got to do good today to make sure everybody feels proud of me. So I said, Knox, here's the deal, buddy. I said, you know you asked me yesterday if I was proud of you? He said, yeah. I said, I want you to know something, bud. I wasn't proud of you yesterday because you hit the ball real hard to center field or you played great. I said, I'm proud of you every day just because you're my son. And I want you to hear that this morning as the first point, is I don't care what you do. God's affection and approval for you is based on the fact that you're his child. And what I'm learning is I will embrace that fact for me as a man and as a father is it's drawing me into greater intimacy and connection with my heavenly father because I know that I don't have to fear coming to him or being in his presence even on my worst day because he loves me because of who I am. I think it's interesting when you speak the second time versus the first time, it, it feels a little bit like, I don't know, easier, not easier, but I feel a little bit better prepared or a little, I got the, the first nervous Nellies out or something like that, I'm not sure, but as Aaron's speaking this morning, I just think about, so, this morning, what I want to do when God asks me to do something is, like, I want to, I want him to be proud. Like, I want to do this right. Like, all week, I wanted to do everything that I thought God needed me to do so he would be proud of me. And as Darren's speaking, I'm realizing it's the perfect lead-in into the next point of, like, all week long, really, all he really wanted from me was for me to be present with him and allow him to be present with me. And it's in those moments of being present in our lives, in relationships, and most importantly with Christ, that we can sense that love from him and that approval and that care that he provides for us. So the next point we're going to get into is we're going to just look at being present and the way that God was present with Christ in his time on earth and about our role in families being present with our families dads being present with their children since it's Father's Day, but also um, in your relationships, being present with people in their life. It's all, yes, it's Father's Day, but it's, this can relate all the way across the board because it's such an important thing in our ministries and in our relationship with Jesus. When Darren was doing some study, he found this from the American Psychological Association, and I love this what it says here, because a lot of times, you know, we feel in families, you know, us by nature, moms tend to take care of a lot of things. You know, the kid throws up, then they want their mom, the kid scrims their knee, they want their mommy when they're really little. It seems like they always want their mommy. Darren would always say that first year of the boys' lives. Um, he was almost glad the first year was over, not because he didn't want him to be little anymore, but they would start to need Darren more and need me a little less less for nourishment, less for just that motherly comfort that I had because I had carried them for nine months. And so they were already, they already had that connection. And then they needed me so much more in those first 12 months. And so he would always say, 
I'm sort of glad to be here because I feel like now it can start to be a little bit more of my turn. And so this, this study says, research on, other research on the role of fathers suggests that the influence of father's love on children's development is as great as the influence of a mother's love. Fatherly love helps children develop a sense of their place in the world which therefore helps their social, emotional, and cognitive development and functioning. Moreover, children who receive more love from their fathers are less likely to struggle with behavioral issues, substance abuse problems, and substance abuse problems. In a world today where being a dad and a father, you know, is, is not, it's not always a place where they're always present. And... I love this quote about our roles as parents and the role of the father in the home is such a massive impact um, on our lives. And I um, am a true testament to that. I, um, I'm actually, I'm actually a, a, a child of a divorced family. Um, when I was two and a half, my biological father left my mom. And it's not that he wasn't um, available um, he made a decision to live 20 hours away in Texas. I lived in North Carolina with my mom. It's not that he didn't provide finances. He did. But those were about the levels that he could handle. And that left my mom as a single mom. And so she was back in North Carolina with this little girl. And that's where she was. And about the time I was four years old, my mom met the most amazing man who is now my, who is my dad. I don't remember a moment of not considering him my dad. He came into my mom's life. He actually was not a Christian when he met my mom. My mom was a, my mom was a Christian and he fell in love with my mom and my mom said, I'm sorry, but if you don't love Jesus, you can't love me and you can't love Julie, so you're out. And he started a journey and he found the Lord. And I tell you, I so often think and totally believe that God can see such a bigger picture than we can see. He, sees, he saw things and plans for my life that even though a giant bump in the road in our family that was broken, he could see plans for me and desires he had for me. And so he gave me my dad. And my dad is amazing. He is a very consistent, you know, hardworking, faithful, loyal man. He wakes up at 3.30 in the morning to go to work. His Bible's always by his breakfast side spot. He reads and prays there every day of my life. And I can truly say, aside from my husband, there has never been a person in my life that has believed in me as much as him. He thinks that I literally do everything better than everyone else. He did not need to think that. And Darren would sometimes think that that was a little unhealthy, that he always thought that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if my mom's listening, she would laugh and agree. But he has just stepped in and he became my dad. My mom and dad, have had, I have a brother and they had a, a son. And, and if you would look at our family from the outside, you would have no idea that divorce was even a part of us because of the way my dad chose to love me. I remember I was about five. They had been married about a year. We were sitting on the front porch steps, put his arm around me and he was like, Julie, if you're ever ready to call me dad, just know that I already consider myself that. And from that point on, my life, that's all I've ever known. And he has just been this massive, consistent part of my life. And there's this thing that hangs in my parents' house. It's a cross stitch. It's like everybody used to cross stitch back in like the eighties or whatever. And it's cross stitch and it's like in a frame and it hangs above my dad's dresser. And it's been above my, dra my dad's dresser my entire life. And on that, it says, any man can be a father, but it takes someone special to be a daddy. And that's always meant so much to me because I knew he was special because he chose me. He di wasn't, he didn't have to. He chose me and was so present in my life. He chose presence. He chose to be at ballet recitals and he chose to be at all these things that he didn't have to. And there's such a significant part of my life because of his presence that allowed me to become the woman of God that I am today. That presence daily 
in and out of my life, that belief in me, that hope in me, all of those things that he provided created this ability for me to become the woman of God that I was always meant to be, that God could see from way back when there was a bump in the road and he was like, I'm going to fix that. Like, I'm going to make that still into who I need her to be for the kingdom of heaven so it can advance. The question today is, are we present with our families? Dads, are you present with your kids? And present meaning like in a relationship, investing in them. When Darren and I were in ministry, we had a, a children's pastor that say, so many parents would get to six and being a children being at the age six would be you would just be like getting, you would just go, go, go. And they needed you to get snacks and feed them and do everything. And then parents would get to six and they'd go on autopilot. And then they would get to 15 or 16 and wonder when they didn't know their kids. And the question is like, are we present today? And are we using the example of God, the father with his son, Jesus? Are we using that example in our life of his presence to make ourselves present? in our families. If you look in Mark 14, 32 through 36, this is when Christ is in the garden and he is in a struggle and he goes there to pray. He goes there to talk to his father and to find peace in a relationship, in a conversation, in a presence that they shared. And it says, they went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him and he began to he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. There in the garden, he sought his father's presence and his father was faithful to be there for him. On the cross, by, in Luke 23, 44 through 46, Jesus cried out to his father, wanting his presence, wanting him there with him. He says, by now it was noon and the whole earth became dark and the darkness lasting three hours, a total blackout. The temple curtain split right down the middle. Jesus called loudly, Father, I place my life in your hands. And then he breathed his last. In his final moments, he wanted presence with his father. And in the last verse that we're going to look at or read from today is in Romans 8, 14 through 17. And it says, now because of Jesus, we have been adopted as his children. And we, we can cry out, Abba, Daddy, and he is present. For those who were led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about by your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. One of the things I love about that quote above my dad's dresser that still hangs there, cross-stitched, is that he chose me to be his daughter. But the beautiful thing is when you stop and you look at that in regards to our relationship with Jesus, he could have just been a father figure. He could have just been a God that seemed maybe scary and dark like we talk about in the Old Testament and fearful and you know maybe unrelatable possibly at that time. But instead, he chose to love us and set the perfect example of what a daddy looks like by sending his son to earth. So instead of just being a father, he made a decision to love us as our daddy, which is so much more intimate and close and personal in relationship when you hear that word daddy and what that means. Do we know the love of the Father like Jesus did? Do you wake up every day and ask for his love? Do you know that love? Darren shared this with me, and I feel like I'm in a very much a similar place. One of the greatest things that I am learning right now is really how good he is. And like when we sing that song this morning, I just feel so thankful that he's good, 
that on my worst days as a believer and on my better days as a believer, he's good. And when I wake up every day, the one thing I know for sure is my daddy loves me. And in our homes, when your kids wake up or in your workplace, the people that you're doing community with, like we talked about last time, or in your marriages or whatever, as an example, do those people know that you love them? Because it's our job to live as he lived, to show love as he shows love. I am so thankful for my daddy's love on this earth. But I'm so thankful for my daddy's love on this earth because it truly showed me what my daddy's in heaven's love is like. And I'm thankful because now that I've seen that, I can so easily see that in Darren. And I can see my boys see that in Darren. And they, Darren saw that in his dad, which he'll talk about some in a minute. But the beauty of the relationships of Christ and him being our Abba Father Daddy and what that means to be present with him and to be present with our children, to be present with others. Thanks, Jules. So proud present. I don't know why everything has to be an alliteration, but it does. And passionate. Your kids know you're proud of them because of who they are, not because of what they do. Are you present with your kids? And dads, I know that can be tough for us, right? It's easy to just get home from work and check out. And I love a good man cave as much as the next guy, right? But oftentimes, and even culture sometimes even glorifies this, is men can be at home but not present, right? And God teaches us a different example. The last thought I want to put out is, is, are we passionate? Are we proud? Are we present? And are we passionate? Are we passionate in our pursuit of our Heavenly Father? And I wish my dad was here this morning. I could give him a, a personal shout-out, but I can't because my dad is at a baseball field watching my kids play taking care of them. And my dad has been at a baseball field or at a band competition or my dad was always there for everything. And I have an amazing, amazing dad. And yesterday I was talking to Cole and uh, we're in the backyard and Cole said, Dad, he said, man, you're really lucky. I said, what do you, what do you mean, bud? He said, well, you're, you're really lucky that you, know, you're, that you had a great dad. You know, Grandpa was, you know, a great dad. And I was like, well, but I said, you know what? I said, I'm very fortunate. I'm very blessed. And I said, but I, I'm not lucky. And I said, because the reality is about Grandpa, as I said, Grandpa wasn't always a great guy. Cole looks at me like, huh? All right. I said, well, when Grandpa was young, he, he, he was kind of a troublemaker. Like my dad was the kind of guy in the small town that would like, you know, get in fights and drink too much and race cars and wreck them and just kind of be a hellion in the town. And then he joined the Marines and became a Marine. And he went to Vietnam, fought in Nam, and he came back, and, uh, and that left its mark on his life. And uh, my parents got married. My dad wasn't a Christian, and he wasn't a very great guy. And um, if I would have been raised by that guy, I don't know what my life would have been. But I, so, I said, Cole, here's what happened. I said, Grandma and Grandpa got married, and about a year after they got married, Grandma became a Christian. And about a year after that, Grandpa became a Christian. And he started to passionately follow after Jesus. And I said, a couple years after Grandpa became a Christian, he felt like God called him to be a pastor. So he packed up our family off this little farmhouse we lived in in Illinois, and he moved us to Marion, Indiana to go get his degree to become a pastor. Then he took his young family and, be and became the first pastor ever in his family. He moved us to Illinois and he pastored. And then after that, Grandpa took an amazing risk because he felt that God was calling him to go to help plant a church. And so he moved our family because of his passionate pursuit of Jesus. He picked our family up and moved us all the way out to Phoenix, Arizona, where we had no family and no friends and no ties and took this huge risk because he passionately followed Jesus. And I said, Cole, I, I'm not lucky. I'm blessed because I have a great dad because grandpa chose to follow Jesus with passion. And I look at my life and I realize there's, there's a quote that a, a mentor of mine shared with me and Julie years ago, 
when we were first becoming parents, he said, here's what I want you guys to remember. He said, and you may have heard this quote before, but he said, so much more is caught than taught as a parent. Your kids will catch from you way more than what you teach them. And what I realized is that what I caught from my dad is that following Jesus is the greatest thing you could ever do. And what I caught from my dad is that every risk that you take to advance the kingdom of God is worth it. And what I caught from my dad is that following Jesus when it's tough is what you need to do. And what I caught from my dad is that you show up to every game and you coach and you're there and you're present with your kids. And what I caught from my dad is that you honor your wife and you do romantic things and you bring her flowers and you're, and you're present and you're proud and you follow Jesus with all your heart. And what I see in Jesus is the exact same thing. So many times through the Gospels, Jesus says, hey, listen, I can't do anything on my own. He says, I only say what I hear the Father say, and I only do what I see the Father do. Multiple, multiple times. We can go through all the scriptures. I'm not going to go through them right now because there's too many of them. But that's what Jesus caught from his Father. It is said that Jesus is the exact manifestation of the Father. That's why Jesus could say, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And there's another saying that my dad used to say all the time is this, is the apple never falls far from the tree, right? And I see that now as a baseball coach and as a youth sports coach for a couple years now. As you, you meet a kid and you're like, this kid's attitude is interesting, right? Yeah. Then you meet her, their mom or dad and you go, oh, What are our kids catching from us, dads? Because we can teach them all the right stuff, right? Hey, we're going to go to church. You're going to go back, get back there with, with Pastor Luke, and you learn the Bible. That's good. Read the Bible. Go to church. Say your prayers. Eat your vitamins. We can teach them all the right things. But the question is, what are they catching from us? Do they see us read the Word of God? Do they see us reluctantly come to church or be a part of the kingdom of God? Do they see us honor and respect their mom? Do they see us serve in the community? Do they see us angry all the time? Do they see a man of God passionately pursuing a relationship with his heavenly father? I'll never forget, I'll close with this story and hand it back over to Julie. It was, uh, it was one of my first Father's Day I don't remember uh, how old Cole was. He was old enough to, to memorize something, so he was two or three. I'm sure they gave me a present that I have no idea what it was, probably socks or shoes or something fun. But I have no idea what I got that Father's Day. But I'll never, ever, ever forget this gift that Cole gave me. As they gave me my gift, and then Julie said, Cole's got something special for you, Darren. And, uh, and there was this country music song out that was just out at that point. I think it's by Rodney Atkins or something. Uh, we like country music uh, in our home. We were at uh, the Florida Georgia Line concert last night, and that's why our voices are raspy, because we were singing way too loud uh, last night. Um, but this song is called, I've Been Watching You. And that day, Cole got up in his little three-year-old self, whatever, and he started singing this chorus. He said, hey, Dad, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you, you know, and eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. We got cowboy boots and camo pants. Yeah, we're just alike. Hey, ain't we, Dad? I want to do everything you do. So I've been watching you. And he looked after me and just beamed and he was. And that was a great moment, and I think I cried a little bit. But the weight of that reality, men, is huge. Our sons, our daughters, they watch us. You know, they sing a man that is passionately pursuing a relationship with his heavenly father. It's a big question to ask. But as you think about it this week, here's what I want you to know. There's probably a lot of areas, guys, that you're totally blowing it right? Because I am. But guess what? Your heavenly father, he's still proud of you because you're a son. 
And on that day that you totally blow it, and your oldest son almost pushes your youngest son down the stairs, and you fly off and smack him in the chest way harder than you should hit him, your father's still present in that moment going, hey, not your best move, probably should apologize. You're right, Dad. And he's passionate about teaching you to be the kind of father that he is. It's Father's Day, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be with Darren and have the opportunity to speak with him and share with you guys from our hearts today. And um, these points today are for all of us. And as women, we play just as much of a significant role in the kind of father as a wife that we live with as, you, as do our children, you know, we have such an important role in how we set up our husbands or fathers or men in our lives to be the best that they can be. And that's not always easy when you take two people and you put them into the same home and you say, hey, you guys are gonna live together and you're gonna do everything just right and then you're gonna have offspring and then you're gonna hope that they're not a you know, giant disaster and we do all <laughs> that right. You know, you're, you, you're striving so hard in, at least I know that we do, and we mess up a lot, trying to be the best that we all can be so that we can be the best we can be for Jesus and our kids can be the best they can be. And, and Darren and I are pretty introspective, and we're always working, working, working to try to, to do better. And Josh and Darren were talking about this week, and, you know, it's Father's Day, and so it's like, oh, it's all kind of towards fathers, you know, and we're going to speak towards fathers. And Mother's Day, it's like, oh, it was all towards moms, you know, or women, and and Josh and Darren were talking about this point and to close out today. And it stuck so clearly in my mind um, in regards to my relationship with Darren. And the question, uh, the statement was in this conversation they were having is that in every person in your home, is the man you're speaking to a prince or is the man you're speaking to a punk? Because there are days when I surely talk to Darren in front of our children, like he's a punk. And so then because of that, because of the way I treated him and the way I set him up in our home, then I now live with the punk. But it's not his fault. It's both of our faults. We're working at it together because I'm not lifting him to be the man he needs to be in our home to be the leader. But when I treat him, or try to treat him like a prince, then it allows him to be a prince. And one thing I've learned from my own dad, from my father-in-law, and from my husband is that when the three of them are lifted up to feel confident to be the men of God that I believe truly in my heart they are, and I lift them up and I support them and believe in them and speak nothing but positive about them, it creates opportunities for them to be the best they can be. So the question for women today, are you living with a prince or a punk because of the way you speak to them? Are you speaking to them like a prince? Are you speaking to them like a punk? Because that's who we live with. Relationships make up all of our lives. They make up our marriages, they make up our parental relationships, they make up our work relationships, our just fun life relationships. And how we treat others, and especially how we teach our children to treat others, is set foundationally in our home by these things we spoke about this morning. I'm thankful today for the generation of men in my life that I've been given. But I know it's also my role as a woman to be able to support them and for them to be the kind of men that they need to be. And most importantly, for Darren to be the one he needs to be. So may we all leave here today making sure the people in our life know, our children know that we're proud of them and to know that, the, that Jesus is proud of them and that for us to be present with them because Jesus is present with us. God has amazing plans for us and he wants to do so much within the family unit. That's one of its greatest avenues for ministry, and it takes us starting there foundationally to be able to share the love of God everywhere. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for this day. We thank you for fathers. We thank you that within a home here on this earth, the way a father lives can set foundationally 
for children the way they view you. I pray that you will give fathers today the strength to live with you, near you, close to you, knowing you're proud of them, knowing you're present with them so that they can be the kind of men they need to be to lead their homes. Thank you, God, for that. We thank you for loving us, caring for us, and for believing us. Amen.